Is there a God? I mean, how can we know that God even exists? That he's real? Well, no one can conclusively prove that God is real, that God exists. But also nobody can prove that he isn't. All we can do is look at the evidence. We have to put the pros on one side and the cons on the other. And then we have to take a leap of faith. Even an atheist has to take a leap of faith to decide that there isn't a God. So let's take a look. One of the biggest arguments people use against the existence of God is that there is so much suffering in the world. If there was really a God and he was good, then why would he let good things happen to bad people? Especially, why would he let children, innocent people, suffer? We could also argue that if there was a God, wouldn't he make it more obvious to us? I mean, like, wouldn't he make it more obvious that he exists? And then everybody would have to believe in him. You'd have to see that he was real. Then when we consider all the different religions in the world who all believe different things, well, surely they can't all be right. So how can there be a God? Maybe there are lots of different gods. And of course, we've got to consider science. Hasn't science disproved the existence of God? These are some tough questions that we have to ask when we're deciding whether God exists or not. There is a theory called the argument of anthropology. Whenever a new tribe of people is discovered on Earth, as in a tribe of people that we've never known about before, it is observed by anthropologists that they always have a belief in God. It might be that they believe in the sun or the moon or even a big rock, but every tribe that has ever been discovered has got some belief in some form of God. This has led anthropologists to believe that within each person there is a desire to reach out for something more powerful, bigger or stronger than they are. The Bible puts it like this. God has made us in his image and he has placed inside us a desire to reach out and try and find him. Then there is the design in creation. Most Christians believe in evolution but they also believe in a master designer behind the evolution. For example, if I was to find this phone lying on the floor, I would not say to myself, I wonder how this phone had evolved. No, I would look at it and say, wow, what a great designing phone. And I wonder who was clever enough to make it. In the same way, when we look at the beauty of creation, we have to wonder, did all this really happen by chance? Or did somebody design it to be the way that it is, to be so beautiful? When a baby is born, we look at the new baby and we say, wow, that's a miracle. There must be a God. Scientists tell us that for life to be created on Earth, the conditions have to be exactly right. In fact, the accuracy of timing that has to exist between the various forces in the universe to make life possible has been described by one scientist who admits that he is not a religious man as the accuracy a marksman would need to hit a one inch target at the other side of the universe. Another scientist who is also not a Christian has said that the likelihood of humanity just happening is a little bit similar to the likelihood of a tornado blowing through a junkyard and creating a Boeing 747. Then there is the argument of human need. Most people basically just go through life and ignore God. They don't have a need for him. But during times of crisis, People often cry out to God for safety and for help. It's often said that in the First World War, when the men went over the top, there wasn't a single one that didn't pray first. And I don't know if you noticed, but during the COVID crisis, particularly when our Prime Minister was in hospital, 
how many of the cabinet said on television how they were thinking and praying for him. In times of crisis, people have a need for God. So what about the moral argument? There are clearly things in our world that are good. A mother's love, kindness, friendship. And there are also things that are bad. Murder, assault, stealing, oppressing the weak. As well as there being a physical universe, we also seem to live in a moral universe. And the big question is, where did that morality come from? Perhaps the existence of a moral universe suggests that it was created by a moral God. But I think for me, one of the biggest pointers towards the existence of God is the difference that he makes in people's lives. Roughly 33% of the world's population are Christians and often when a person becomes a Christian they change. I'm not talking about willpower or thinking that they should lead a better life, which is a good thing. I'm talking about change through the power of God working in their lives. I can think of people who I have been associated with who have experienced a huge transformation in their lives once they became a Christian not just becoming better people but dramatic practical changes like turning away from a violent life of crime or conquering drink or drug addictions or becoming reconciled to family members where there was previously no hope it's that transformation in lots of people's lives that makes me believe that there is a god so we have to look at the evidence for god the evidence for him and the evidence against him and then we have to weigh it up and once we've done that we then have to take a leap of faith. If no one has ever seen God, then what is he like? The Bible gives us lots of different pictures of God that we then have to put together to create a whole. It's a little bit like making a jigsaw where you put all the different pieces in and then when you finish, you've got a big picture. This is how we find out what God is like. He is described as shepherd, father, friend, creator, judge, king, and savior. So if God is all of these things, what does that mean for us? You see, if God is like a shepherd to me, then what does that make me? Well, I guess that means that he's supposed to look after me, to care for me, to lead me through my life. And for me, well, it means that I've got to trust him to look after me, to trust him to take care of me. And of course, I suppose it means I've got to be obedient to him. When he calls and he tries to lead me, I've got to trust him enough to follow him. If God is the creator, then that means that I must be the created. So that means that God made me the way that I am. He means that he made all the things that I'm good at and he made all the things that I'm not so good at. And he must like me, otherwise why would he have made me this way? If God is father, then I must be his daughter. In the Bible, it says that all Christians are heirs. When we become Christians, we become heirs to God's fortune. This means that we ought to inherit all the good things that God wants to give us. Amazingly, God also describes us as his friends, which means that we have the best friend that we could ever hope to have in God. God is also described as judge. So if God is our judge, this means that we must be the accused or maybe a criminal. If God is described as king, then that means that he must be the ruler of a kingdom, which makes us his servants or his subjects. So no matter how much of a friend he is to us, there's always an understanding that he is more important, that he is in charge of us in some way. And of course, God is described as our saviour. This means that he offers us salvation. If you put all of these pictures together, then we get a far clearer picture of what God is like. Of all of these pictures, which is the one that appeals to you the most? What is the image that you have of God? And how does that affect the way that you see him?